In 1997, British physicist J.J. Thomson discovered the existence of a tiny charged particle, which he called an electron for his cathode ray tube experiments. He showed that electrons were negatively charged and they could transmit negative charges by moving from one object to another. He also found the ratio of a charge of an electron to its mass. He wasn't able to determine exactly how much charge and mass each electron had. It wasn't until 1999 that American physicists Robert Mookin and PhD student Harvey Fletcher came up with a very clever way to determine the magnitude of a charge in a single electron, which we now call the elementary charge for the oil drop experiment. By using electric field to suspend charge drops of oil, they were able to calculate the charge on each drop. They concluded that the magnitude of charge on a single electron to be 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 coulombs. The discovery of a charge of a single electron, or the elementary charge, led to a range of other scientific discoveries. However, Leonard Millikan was credited for the work which led him to win the Nobel Prize, but he had gone to assist Fletcher in future career as a physicist. Let's talk about the equipment Millikan and Fletcher used to do the experiment. It is like a big chamber and here's a cross section of it. Up here is an atomizer. It's like a perfumist that in this case squirts little droplets of oil into this area. Now they chose to use oil because they need a liquid droplet that can retain its mass and centrifugal shape throughout the course of the experiment in order to do their calculations reliably. In addition to that, they use a very specific type of oil which has extremely low vapor pressure so it does not evaporate as much as ordinary oil. Now some of the oil droplets from this area will fall into this hole in this round metal plate due to gravity and end up in this area. As the droplets are really tiny, there is a microscope and light source looking into the chamber that allows the observer to see individual drops clearly. Let's take a look at one of the oil droplets as it drops. Due to gravity, there is a gravitational force pulling the oil droplet down. As it falls, there is going to be air resistance based on the viscosity of air as the droplet moves through the air. Now one of the reasons why Millikan and Fletcher didn't use a vacuum chamber is that they can use the viscosity of air to aid in their calculations when balancing the oil droplets. What they have here too is an x-ray tube that ionizes the air. When the air is ionized, it is separated into positive ions and electrons, where the electrons are free to move much more easily compared to before being stripped from the molecular structure of the non-ionized air. This allows them to easily attach themselves to other atoms compared to the positive ions. As a drop of oil passes through this ionized air, it will become negatively charged as it gains the free moving electrons in the air. Now there's also a battery that's connected to two metal parallel plates at above and below this bottom chamber. By doing so, they were able to apply voltage across the plates and creates a uniform electric field between them, with the bottom plate being negatively charged and the top plate positively charged. Initially, the oil drops allowed to fall into this bottom chamber with the electric field between the plates off, but it will quickly reach terminal velocity due to friction of air inside the chamber, that is, the maximum constant velocity attainable by an object as it falls through a fluid, which in this case is air. When the electric field is turned on, there are two main forces going to act on the oil droplet. We know that opposite charges attract and light charges repel. So for a negatively charged oil drop, you will want to repel from the negative plate as of the same charge, going not being attracted to the positive plate. At the same time, there is a gravitational force pulling the oil drop down. Hence, there is an electric force going up and a gravitational force going down. The direction in which the oil drop will go will be determined by whichever force is greater, that is, by the net force acting on the oil droplet. What Millikan and Fletcher wanted to do was to balance the two forces on the oil droplet in a way where it is suspended in mid-air. They had some sort of voltage dial where they could regulate the amount of voltage applied to the plates, affecting the electric field strength. If the voltage is turned too high, the electric force will be greater than the gravitational force and hence the oil drop will go up. If the voltage is turned too low, the gravitational force will be greater and the oil drop will go down. By adjusting the voltage precisely, they were able to balance out the two forces and allow the oil droplet to suspend in mid-air, allowing them to do calculations to determine the charge of an electron. So what were the calculations that they did? First off, by suspending the oil droplet in mid-air, the known electric force going upwards is equal to the gravitational force going downwards. To find the electric force in terms of variables they know, they used the formula of electric field strength between two parallel plates and subbed it into the electric force formula to get this equation here. Fe is equal to Vq on D. Note that they know V and D, but they don't know Q and that's all they're trying to find. Now if we look at the gravitational force, it is equal to the weight of the oil droplet, which is equal to mg. By finding the mass of the oil droplet using this equation here, m equals rho v, they get this equation here. fg is equal to rho 4 and 3 pi r cube g. Note that they found the density of the oil droplet by measuring large quantity of oil, and the volume of the oil droplets by assuming they were perfect spherical drops, hence using the volume of the formula. Since the electric force is equal to gravitational force, they can equate them and get this equation here. Since they want to find the charge, they can rearrange to make Q the subject. 
Now, they know that what the density of the oil was. Pi is a constant. They know the force of gravity, the distance between two parallel plates, and the voltage applied. However, the left of R cubed, that is the radius of the oil droplets, which was initially a problem for Millikan and Fletcher to solve. Remember when the oil drops would fall into the bottom chamber with the electric field between the plates off? They were falling at terminal velocity, so it's not getting faster or slower. According to Stokes' law, it says that for a spherical object falling in a viscous fluid, which in this case is air, the upward force due to the drag is equal to the downward force due to the weight of the object. Using Stokes' law, the force of drag is equal to 6 pi r e to v. Note that they found the terminal velocity of the oil droplet by measuring the distance the oil drop travelled over time through the microscope. So when they equated the drag force and the weight of the object, they get this equation here, where the weight of the object was determined earlier. By rearranging to make r the subject, they get this equation here, where the viscosity of air, terminal velocity of the oil droplet, the density of oil, and the force of gravity is known. If we take this equation and sub it back into the equation of charge we found here, we can find the charge of oil droplet as all the variables and constants are known. This is one of the reasons why Millikan Fletcher chose to do this experiment in a non-vacuum chamber, so they can use Stokes' law to help find an equation for the charge of the oil droplet. Now in reality for this experiment, most of these variables are varied depending on each droplet, hence why Millikan Fletcher had to repeat the experiment numerous of times as a lot of sources of potential experimental error. At times as well, they also vary the strength of the X-ray ionizing the air, so a different number of electrons can attach to the oil droplet each time. Here's a simplified list of the results they got. They measured the charge of each droplet in septocoulombs, which is a very small unit of charge. Now when they looked at the results, they noticed a pattern. They noticed that the charge of oil droplets was always a multiple of 160 septocoulombs, which is also the smallest value of charge they could get. They found that the charges were never equal to numbers like 210 septicoulombs, 455 septicoulombs, etc., but always a multiple of 160 septicoulombs. Hence, Millikan and Fletcher concluded that each of the oil droplets must have gained a certain number of electrons, and was able to quantize the charge of a single electron to be 160 septicoulombs, or 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 coulombs. This result can be known as the elementary charge. If we look back to J.D. Thompson's cathode tube experiments, he showed that electrons were being recharged, hence the charge of an electron is minus 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 coulombs. Note that this minus means that it is negatively charged and not numerically negative. Now in reality, the result they got was 1.59 times 10 to minus 19 coulombs, which is close to the accepted value of today, which is this value here. This is because for the experiment, they use an inaccurate value for the viscosity of air as we know it today, as well as not considering the buoyant force of the oil droplet in their calculations. Later scientists will improve on the experiment, which would lead to this value here. Now record that J.J. Thompson had discovered the charge to mass ratio of an electron, which is this value here. With the discovery of the charge of an electron from the oil drop experiment, J.J. Thompson was able to use it to determine the mass of an electron. By substituting the charge of an electron in rearranging to make the mass of an electron the subject, J.J. Thompson was able to calculate the mass of an electron to be 9.1 times 10 to minus 31 kilograms. Note that there is no negative sign or sign for the charge of an electron because the sign only indicates that an electron is negatively charged and that mass cannot be negative. This isn't the only contribution the discovery of the charge of an electron had. Through these experiment and later revisions, Millikan and Fletcher was able to correct Stokes' law as they overestimated the friction force applied to a spherical object in a viscous fluid. By doing so and considering the other factors they did not consider, the calculations to find the charge of an electron became much more complicated compared to what I've showed you before. Millikan also used the charge of electrons as part of his method to accidentally prove Einstein's theory of the photoelectric effect, where the concept was originally brought up by Heinrich Rudolf Hertz. By proving the existence of photons, that is the photoelectric effect, the idea of quantum theory at the time started to get more attention and development. The discovery of the charge of electrons also led to the discovery of the charge of protons and their mass by Ernest Rutherford in his Gold Foil experiments. Note that there were many scientific discoveries made by a range of wonderful scientists using the charge of electrons to prove their theories, and these are only the few. With the discovery of the charge of electrons through the oil drop experiment by Millikan and Fletcher, they were able to expand the world of science.